Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in this 12th session, I have come with the topic rule of hearing. It is in continuation to the discussion over principles of mutual justice. In earlier session, we discussed the rule against bias, the first principle of natural justice. In the present session, we are going to discuss the rule of hearing the second important component or the second rule of principles of natural justice, the rule of hearing. This rule of hearing is represented by a maxim, audi ultram partum. Audi ultram partum means nobody should be condemned unheard. It signifies that a person must be given an adequate and sufficient opportunity to defend himself the adjudicatory authority is not allowed to give the decision without providing the adequate and sufficient opportunity of hearing. It also means that every party to the case should be given the maximum opportunity to explain his or her case and to produce the evidence and material in his or her favor. The party to the case must also be given the sufficient opportunity to contradict or revert the adverse evidence or the material. The audi ultram partum means here the other side or here both the sides before arriving at any decision. The principle of audi ultram partum is founded on the rule that nobody should be condemned even in administrative adjudicatory proceedings unless he has been given an opportunity of being heard. It was held by the Supreme Court of India in the case of Competition Commission of India versus Steel Authority of India Limited decided in 2010. This audi ultram partum or the rule of hearing, it is a code of judicial procedure involving several stages and various components. This principle is an indispensable requirement of any civilized society and it is of very ancient origin. We know that the opportunity recognized by this rule was given to Adam and Eve even by God himself before inflicting the punishment on them for disobeying his command. There are various components of rule of hearing. There are various stages of the hearing and each and every stage or each and every component of hearing involves certain rights of the parties to the case. This code of judicial procedure involves several stages, several components and every component of this code gives rise to a right to the parties to the case. These stages and the rights emerging out of these stages or components are number one, notice the first stage of hearing or the initial stage of hearing or the stepping stone to the hearing procedure is the notice and it gives rise to both the parties of the case the right to notice. The second component or the second stage of hearing is right to know the evidence and it gives rise to the right to know the evidence. Supply of adverse evidence by the adjudicatory authority to the parties concerned is also an important component of the hearing procedure and this gives rise to the parties to present their own case or to know the evidence. 
opportunity to present the favorable evidence is the next stage and it gives rise to the parties to the case the right to present his or her own case. Then the next stage of the case comes, the next stage of the procedure of hearing comes that is the opportunity to revert the evidence, the opportunity to revert the adverse material and this component or this stage of hearing that is the opportunity to revert the evidence or the opportunity to contradict the evidence gives rise to a certain right to the parties to the case that is right to revert the evidence. Right to revert the evidence involves two further rights of the parties to the case. Number one, right to cross examination and right to legal representation. This is the final stage of hearing and any authority involves in the function of adjudication or exercising the adjudicatory powers after this stage of hearing makes the decision. At this stage of decision or this component of hearing one further right is recognized that is right to region decision. In the modern times even after a decision a right has been evolved a right has been recognized by the Supreme Court of India that is the, the, the next stage or one more stage was recognized that is the post decisional hearing and it gives rise to the right to post decisional hearing. There are some other components of hearing also. There are some other elements of hearing also which make the procedure of hearing sound, which make the procedure of hearing fair, which make the procedure of hearing impartial, which make the procedure of hearing just and reasonable. These other components are the inquiry report must be shown to the parties. If the adjudicator arrives at the conclusion or at any decision on the basis of any inquiry report. One more component which makes the hearing procedure as fair and just is that one who hears must decide or one who decides must hear. In this regard, the institutional decisions are to be discussed with reference to this rule of natural justice that whether these institutional decisions in accordance with the standards of principles of natural justice or not where the authorship of any particular decision cannot be known. One more component or element of hearing which makes it fair and reasonable is that no evidence shall be taken on the back of the parties. This is the rule of principles of natural justice that evidence shall always be taken in the presence of the party not on its back or not on in its present. These are the different components of hearing. The first component of hearing is right to notice and it gives rise to the parties to the case the right to notice. Every party to the case is involved is entitled that it must get the notice from any adjudicatory authority which is going to take the decision against that person. This right to notice is the stepping stone to the hearing procedure. It seems that the requirement of notice is a mandatory requirement for making the right to defend a person meaningful because no one can defend himself or herself without knowing the formulations of subject matter and issues involved in the case. Only after knowing that what are the allegations one can defend himself. In addition to the requirement of giving notice, it is also required that the notice must be adequate, the notice must be sufficient so that the person concerned may take the sufficient information about the case. No precise standards for examining the adequacy and sufficiency of notice have been evolved. It depends on the facts and circumstances of particular notice, particular case and the particular notice being issued by the administrative 
adjudicatory authority. The adequacy and sufficiency of any notice is relative and depends on the facts and circumstances of each individual case. For any notice to be adequate, for any notice to be sufficient, it must contain the following informations. Though we, though I have told you that no precise standards have been laid down for the adequacy and sufficiency of the notice, but for any notice to be adequate and sufficient, at least following informations must be there in the notice whenever the adjudicatory authority issues the notice to the party concerned. The notice must contain the date, the time and the place of hearing. The notice must contain the nature of hearing. The notice must contain in itself the authority before which the person is to appear. The notice must include in itself the particulars of the specific charges which the person is to face. The person should be given sufficient time to comply with the requirement of notice. This is also one important essential for any notice to be adequate for not any notice to be sufficient. We can refer to the case of state of Jammu and Kashmir versus Haji Wali Muhammad, which was decided in 1972 by the Supreme Court of India. In this case, the notice was issued by the authority and only 24 hours time was given to the person concerned, was given to the petitioner to demolish a building. This 24 hours time for demolition of a building was considered as not sufficient, not adequate time and this notice was considered by the Supreme Court to be inadequate notice, to be insufficient notice. We can understand the sufficiency and adequacy of notice by taking some examples or illustrations wherein the Supreme Court of India talks about the requirements of notice. It has also been decided by the Indian courts, for example, the Gujarat High Court in the case of Gobind Singh versus Subba Rao in 1971 held that the person cannot be punished for any charge other than the charges given in the notice. And this important principle which was laid down by the Gujarat High Court in 1971 that a person cannot be punished for any charge other than the charges given in the notice itself is being followed by the courts in India. We can refer to the case of Joseph Belangidan versus executive engineer decided in 1978 by the Supreme Court of India to see whether the punishment can be given for any such charge which has not specifically been included in the notice itself. In Joseph case, the notice was considered to be inadequate when the contract was cancelled and the contractor was debarred from all future contracts under the PWD and the Supreme Court quashed the decision. In this case, the relevant notice contained the sentence, just see the sentence, the statement which was given in the notice by the authority. You are therefore requested to show cause within 7 days from the receipt of this notice why the work may not be arranged otherwise at your risk and the loss through other agencies after devouring you as defaulter. This was the content of the notice that you are therefore requested to show cause within 7 days from the receipt of this notice why the work may not be arranged otherwise at your risk and loss through other agencies after devouring you as defaulter. When this notice was served to the appellant, the appellant replied that the delay was attributed to the respondent's conduct and not because of his conduct. Even then, he was debarred from all the future contracts. So, the Supreme Court says that it was not specifically mentioned in the notice that the person would be debarred from all the future contracts 
of PWD and therefore, the decision was the notice was quashed and notice was considered to be inadequate. This is the established principle of natural justice that a person is entitled to know the adverse evidence and it would be the state of violation of natural justice when the authority takes into consideration some information without disclosing it to the person concerned. And this particular principle gives rise to the right to know the evidence in the next stage that the person has the right or to the next component of hearing that the material should be disclosed or the adverse material, adverse evidence should be disclosed to the person concerned. This principle was laid down in the case of Dhakesuri Cotton Mills versus CIT, Commissioner of Income Tax decided in 1955 by the Supreme Court of India. In Dhakesuri Cotton Mills case, some information was supplied to the Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. The tribunal considered this information, takes the decision on the basis of this information, but it did not disclose the information to the person concerned. And therefore, it was considered to be the violation of the right of the party to the case that it was not given the opportunity to know the evidence. It is also important to know that the Supreme Court of India in the same case held that it is not necessary for the authority to provide the or to supply the information as such which was supplied to the department or the authority. If only the summary of the adverse material, if only the summary of the adverse evidence, if only the summary of that material is supplied or disclosed to the party concerned, it is sufficient for fulfilling the requirement or the obligation under this stage or under this component of hearing. The next component of hearing is the opportunity to present the case and this gives rise to the next right to the parties to the case that every party to the case is entitled to the right to present the case. This right to present the case may be availed by the parties to the case by the person concerned in two ways. Number one, by written submissions and number two, by oral hearings. In the case of Union of India versus J.P. Mittar, there was the dispute relating to the age of High Court judge. As we know, we have already discussed under the concept of principles of natural justice that the natural justice means the common sense justice, the natural justice means the circumstantial justice, the natural justice is sufficiently flexible procedure to be adopted by the authorities. It refers to the minimum fair procedure, meaning thereby the minimum procedure to be applied to be adopted to be followed by any administrative adjudicatory authority to make the hearings to make the procedure fair and therefore, it is not necessary for the authority to adopt or to follow an elaborate procedure. The authority is required only to apply, only to adopt, only to follow the minimum procedure which makes the proceedings as fair, which is similarly applicable to this right also or to this stage of hearing, this component of hearing also that the oral hearings are not necessary in all the cases. If the person is capable of explaining himself or to presenting his case properly before the authority only by the written submissions, then the denial of the right to oral hearings, the denial of opportunity of oral hearings may not be violative of principles of natural justice. But if the case involves any such circumstances, wherein the person concerned cannot explain his or her case only by the written submissions, then the oral hearings must be given. The opportunity of oral hearings becomes necessary for the authority to provide to the 
person concerned. In the case of J.P. Mittar, there was the issue, there was the question of the determination of the age of high court judge. When this matter reached to the president of India, when he was deciding the case, the person concerned requested for the opportunity of oral hearings and it was denied by the president of India and the case was decided. Then this decision of the president on the age of high court judge was challenged for the violation of principles of natural justice for the reason that the sufficient and adequate opportunity of hearing was not provided on the ground that even on his request the opportunity of oral hearings was denied. The Supreme Court of India in this case did not accept the contention and decided that there was no violation of principles of natural justice because the matter of the determination of the age of a high court judge is not such a question which could be determined only by involving the oral hearings. Only the documentary evidence, only the written submissions are sufficient to explain the case. In the case of Trevon Correans versus Union of India decided in 1971 by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says that when complex and technical questions are involved, opportunity of oral hearings becomes necessary. For examples, in the matter of citizenship, this is very sensitive issue to determine the citizenship of any person. So, in the matters of citizenship, the oral hearings becomes must and if the opportunity of oral hearing is denied by the authority that would amount to be the violation of principles of natural justice. We can refer to the case of Union of India versus Chand Putli decided by the Allahabad High Court in 1973, wherein the Allahabad High Court held that if an order of deportation is passed against any person on the ground that he or she is not an Indian citizen, then the oral hearings become important, significant and denial of oral hearings would be violative of principles of natural justice. In the case of Bhagat Singh versus State of Punjab decided in 1975 by Punjab and Haryana High Court, the Punjab and Haryana High Court was of the view that if the question of cancellation of liquor license and thereby a heavy financial loss to the licensee is involved and the licensee wishes to any controversial to raise any controversial issue of fact by availing oral hearings, then the oral hearings must be granted. In the case of Diwan Singh versus State of Haryana decided by the Supreme Court of India in 1976, the Supreme Court held that oral hearings are necessary in matters of dismissal of civil servants. What are the circumstances, what are the conditions wherein the oral hearings become part and parcel of principles of natural justice or oral hearings becomes the significant component of the code of procedure of hearing. When the statute itself requires the opportunity of oral hearings, then it is mandatory for the authority to provide the oral hearings. If the statute does not make the requirement and the authority permits one party, it must be granted to the other party also. So, in these two points, two different situations are arising. Number one, the ordinary rule is that if the statute or the parent act provides for the requirement of oral hearings, then it is mandatory for the authority to grant the opportunity of oral hearings to the person concerned. It may mean that if the particular statute, if the parent act does not provide for any such requirement, 
the authority may not provide for the oral hearings, the authority may deny the oral hearings in the case. But at the same time, it has also been held by the courts in India that even in the situation where the statute does not make any requirement of oral hearings, if the authority permits one party to the case, then it is mandatory for the authority to permit the other party also for the opportunity of oral hearings. Because if it is not given by the administrative adjudicatory authority, that would be violation of equality and that would make the proceedings unfair, unjust and unreasonable. The next stage which is involved in this code of procedure of hearing is the opportunity to revert the adverse material. Suppose the proper notice was given to the person concerned, the person was also granted the opportunity to present his or her own case, to present the material or the evidence in his or in her favor. It is not sufficient for the proceedings to be fair. What is additionally required is that that person must also be given the opportunity to rebut or to contradict the adverse material. The sufficient and adequate opportunity to contradict, to rebut the adverse evidence, the adverse material should also be provided to the person concerned. And therefore, this component of hearing or this stage of hearing gives, recognizes a further right of the person concerned or parties to the case that that person has or the parties to the case have the right to revert the adverse material, right to contradict the adverse evidence. This right to revert the adverse material may involve two further rights. Number one, right to cross examination and right to legal representation. Right to cross examination, this is the opportunity where the person concerned is allowed to cross examine the witnesses who gave the evidence against him. As we know that the principles of natural justice or the rules involved in the principles of natural justice are sufficiently flexible and they are not codified canons. It also refers to the minimum procedure and therefore, what is minimum required in a certain circumstance is mandatory for the authority to provide for. We can understand it by referring some cases. In the case of state of Jammu and Kashmir versus Bakshi Gulam Muhammad, there was an inquiry against Bakshi Gulam Muhammad under the relevant provisions of Commission of Inquiry Act 1960, Jammu and Kashmir Commission of Inquiries Act 1968. Bakshi Gulam Muhammad was politician, he was once the Chief Minister of the State of Jammu and Kashmir. So, the inquiries were being conducted against Bakshi Gulam Muhammad for the charges of corruption. Some witnesses filed their affidavits. They gave their statements through the affidavits. There was a request on the part of Bakshi Gulam Muhammad that he should be given the opportunity to cross examine the witnesses who gave the statements, who gave the evidence through their statements in their affidavits. But the Supreme Court of India in this case did not accept this request, denied the opportunity of cross examination on the basis that it would be embarrassing for the witnesses to be present before such a politician and that would also be detrimental to the life and liberty of those witnesses. And therefore, in accordance with the principles of natural justice, he 
should not be given the opportunity to cross examine the witnesses. Likewise, in the case of Hiranath Mishra versus Principal Rajendra Medical College, there was the allegation by some female students against some male students that they entered into a girls hostel and they performed some obscene activities there. On the complaint of girl students, the inquiry was conducted and the male students were punished. They requested for the opportunity of cross examination, but the opportunity of cross examination was not given to the male students on the basis that it would not be fair, it would not be reasonable, it would not be in accordance with the principles of ritual justice to disclose the identity of the witnesses in this inquiry. We can also refer to the case of S. K. Suri versus Principal M. A. Mahavidyalaya. In S. K. Suri versus Principal Mahavidyalaya, also the opportunity of cross examination, the question of the opportunity of cross examination was there, and the court decided that where the witnesses have orally deposed, the refusal to allow cross examination would certainly amount to the violation of principles of ritual justice. So, this is the situation or the circumstance where the opportunity of cross examination becomes mandatory to be given to be provided by the administrative adjudicatory authority that if any witnesses are deposed orally, then the other side should be given the opportunity to cross examine the oral evidence of those witnesses. In the case of SC Grotra versus United Commercial Bank, it was decided that when the charges are there on the basis of the report of an inquiry and that report of an inquiry has already been supplied to the person concerned, then there is no need to give the opportunity of cross examination. In the area of labor relations, in the area of disciplinary proceedings against civil servants, in the domestic inquiries by the employers for taking disciplinary actions against their employees, in the area of labor and management relations, in the area of disciplinary proceedings by a statutory corporation against its employees, it is the rule that the opportunity to cross examine the witnesses should be given to the person concerned. The second important right which is involved at this stage of hearing is the right to legal representation. With reference to right to legal representation, it has been a dominant thought that the lawyer should be kept away from the area of administrative adjudication for the reason that involvement of lawyers in the administrative adjudicatory proceedings would make the proceedings more technical, more complex, more formal, more expensive and more delayed. And therefore, the lawyer should be kept away from the area of administrative adjudication because it reduces the delay in the proceedings, it saves the expenses and thus it protects the poor against the richers, it prevents the proceedings from becoming complex, formal and more technical. So, this is the one side of the coin where it has been the dominant thought that lawyers should be kept away from the area of administrative adjudication. But on the other hand, there is one more aspect which has been highlighted by Professor C. K. Allen, when he says that the service of a professional, service of a competent person to those who are unable to express themselves is very mistaken kindness. Certainly, it is very important that the objective of the whole audialtum partum, whole rule of hearing is that a person concerned must be given the adequate and sufficient opportunity to explain himself or herself. 
and if a person is not capable of explaining himself before the authority and he is denied the opportunity of legal representation, he is denied the help or the assistance of a professional or a competent person of a lawyer, then certainly it would be a mistaken kindness. And therefore, the right to legal representation has been recognized in Australia. According to administrative jurisdiction 79 in 1956, the appearance of a lawyer before the tribunal is the rule and non-appearance is an exception. In US also, the combined effect of due process of law and section 555B of the Administrative Tribunal Act 1946 together safeguards the right to legal representation. In England, earlier there was no practice because it was the dominant thought that lawyers should be kept away from the area of administrative adjudication. But the Franks committee recommended for the requirement of legal representation. We have already discussed that the Franks committee was constituted to inquire into the area of administrative adjudication after the happening of the crucial down affair in England. There are some English cases wherein the law was laid down by the courts regarding the opportunity of legal representation. Pet versus Greyhound Racing Association is such a case. Right to in this case, it was decided that right to legal representation was is necessary in the matters of a person's reputation, livelihood, and matter of serious import and where oral hearings are granted. So, some situations have been identified by the court in which the right to legal representation was recognized or it should be given. But in the pet second, the court deferred from the opinion expressed in pet first case. Then in 1971, Andrewary Town Football Club versus Football Association case was decided. And in this case, the court decided that there is no absolute right to legal representation. It is a matter of discretion of the adjudicatory authority, but the authority cannot lay down an absolute rule against legal representation. The authority must always be willing to grant the legal representation. If we see the position of this right to legal representation in India, the factory laws do not allow legal representation. Industrial Dispute Act allows it with the approval of the tribunal under section 36.2 AB and section 36.2 4. Under section 282 of Income Tax Act, one can avail the opportunity of legal representation as a matter of right. In India, the courts have identified certain situations where the right to legal representation must be granted to the party to make his right meaningful and effective. Some situations have been identified in India also by Indian courts wherein right to re legal representation was recognized and it was considered to be mandatory requirement under the rule of hearing. In the case of James Vasi versus Collector of Ganjam, the Orissa High Court held that the legal representation is mandatory when the person is illiterate. In the case of Nataranjan versus State of Urisa again, when a matter is complicated and technical, the right to legal representation should be recognized. In the case of Harish Chandra versus Registrar Cooperative Society, decided in 1966 by Madhya Pradesh High Court, the court was of the opinion that the legal representation becomes mandatory requirement under the rule of hearing when the expert evidence is on record. In the case of Krishna Chandra versus Union of India, the Supreme Court held that the legal representation becomes the mandatory requirement when the question of law is involved in the case. In the case of C. L. Subramanyam versus Collector of Customs decided by the Supreme Court in 1972, the court was of the opinion that when a person is facing trained prosecution, the right to legal representation is must. 
in nandini satpati versus p l dani it was decided by the supreme court that during custodial interrogation the police must wait for the reasonable time for the arrival of the lawyer so the legal representation becomes necessary during the custodial interrogation in the case of khatri versus state of bihar the supreme court was of the opinion that the state is constitutionally bound to provide legal representation to poor and indigent accused not only at the stage of trial but also at the stage of remand the state of remand refers to the the state of administrative adjudication so the in administrative or administrative adjudicatory processes the right to legal representation for poor and indigent persons was recognized in the case of khatri versus state of bihar a most significant decision of the supreme court of india in mh hoskart versus state of maharashtra it is also not out of reference it is important to know that in this case under article 21 within the right to life and personal liberty the right to free legal aid was considered to be the fundamental right legal representation to the poor and indigent persons was recognized fundamental right under article 21 in this case in the case of ak roy versus union of india decided in 1982 the supreme court says that even if the act disallow the legal representation the legal representation should be given the opportunity of legal representation should be granted if the state is represented through the lawyer so if the act disallows the legal representation it disallows for both the accused and the state if a state is represented through the lawyer then the person concerned should also be given the opportunity in ak roy versus union of india there was the question of legal representation in the case of preventive detention article 223b of indian constitution disallows the legal representation for detainees who are detained under the prevented detention laws but the supreme court has been of consistent opinion that if the advisory board is represented through the advocate through the lawyer then the detainees must also be given the opportunity of legal representation even if it has been disallowed by article 223b of indian constitution now as to the component and stages of hearing the stage of decision making is reached and at this stage of decision making there is one important right which has been recognized even in administrative adjudicatory proceedings that is right to reasoned decision earlier there was no practice but again i would like to refer the recommendation of franks committee which recommended that there shall be general practice for administrative adjudicatory bodies to give reasons for their decision in menka gandhi versus union of india which is very prominent decision of the supreme court of india as to the interpretation of article 21 and particularly to the phrase procedure established by law under article 21 in this case the supreme court was of the firm opinion that when the statute imposes the requirement of giving reasons the provision is treated as mandatory and we know that in the same case the supreme court considered the decision of passport officer to be illegal invalid and violative of principles of natural justice when the passport officer did not disclose the reasons for impounding the passport under the passport act because under the passport act there was the requirement for giving the reasons for any such kind of decision in the case of collector of mongir versus keshab decided 1962 by the supreme court of india the supreme court says that if the reasons recorded are totally irrelevant the exercise of power will be void it means that only giving the reasons is not sufficient for any authority to fulfill the requirement of principles of natural justice or the rule of hearing in addition to giving the opportunity 
in addition to giving the reasons it is also important for the authority to give the adequate and sufficient reasons whether the reasons are sufficient or not whether the reasons are adequate or not it depends on the facts and circumstances of individual cases the court will decide case to case whether the particular reasons given in a case are sufficient or not we can refer to the cases like narendranath bora versus commissioner hills division bhagat raja versus union of india siemens engineering versus union of india tarachand versus delhi municipality imperial chemical industries versus restar trademark to know the different aspects of the right to regions region decisions this is also the question whether the appellate authority is required to give the reasons if the decision making authority has already given the reasons the court has been of the consistent view that the appellate authority should give the reasons of its decision particularly in the circumstance when the appellate authority approves the decision and the decision making authority adjudicatory authority did not give it if the appellate authority disapproves the decision given by the adjudicatory body and the adjudicatory body had already given the reasons the appellate authority is under the mandatory obligation to give the reasons other components of hearing are the post decisional hearing one who hears must decide evidence shall not be taken in the back of the party and the inquiry report shall be shown to the parties as to the post decisional hearing i have already told you that menka gandhi case is the case wherein the idea of post decisional hearing the concept of post decisional hearing was propounded by the supreme court of india there are various aspects of the post decisional hearing the relevant question is whether the post decisional hearing subserves the objective of principles of natural justice because the essence of the rule of hearing is that nobody should be condemned unheard and no administrative adjudicatory authority or even the adjudicatory authority or the formal courts should give the decision without hearing both the parties or without giving both the parties the opportunity of adequate and sufficient hearing in menka gandhi case the idea of post decisional hearing was evolved but if you see the follow up of this concept by the supreme court of india it seems that the supreme court itself was not convinced with the idea of post decisional hearing after menka gandhi case in sodeshi cotton mills versus union of india which was decided in 1981 the idea of the concept of post decisional hearing was invoked the opportunity of post decisional hearing was given but in ki seford versus union of india the supreme court was of the view that the post decisional hearing cannot subserve the objectives of principles of natural justice particular in the case where the authority deprives any person from right to livelihood you throw a person from the employment and then give you give him the opportunity of hearing it is not in accordance with the standards of principles of natural justice in the case of hl trehan versus union of india also the supreme court was of the same view so what is the relevance of the post decisional hearing when the post decisional hearing becomes the component of principles of natural justice we can say with reference to the statement of professor smith that the pre decisional hearing is better than the post decisional hearing but the post decisional hearing is better than no hearing we know that there are some circumstances to be faced or being faced by the administration where the administration may not be in position to provide the opportunity of hearing before taking the decision there may be the need of emergent decisions in such a cases where the authority cannot provide 
the pre decisional hearing the post decisional hearing may be the option because the post decisional hearing is better than the pre decisional hearing if there is no option for the pre decisional hearing otherwise the pre decisional hearing is the rule so in the rarest of rare cases where any such emergent situation is involved or where is no consequences no severe consequences of denial of the pre decisional hearing the post decisional hearing may be the option within other components of hearing there are three important aspects number 1 one who hears must decide and it is it is to be discussed with reference to the institutional decisions to see to examine the validity of institutional decision the evidence shall not be taken in the back of the party the inquiry report shall be shown to the parties concerned one who hears must decide it is also an established rule of principles of natural justice because that the person who does not hear the parties he cannot understand the different aspects of the proceedings and he cannot take the objective decisions and therefore this is the rule that one who hears must decide but in the cases of institutional decisions even the house of lords in the case of earlies has decided that it is not always necessary to know the authorship of decisions because in institutional decisions the decision is taken at various stages there is the involvement of the various officials of the department and the authorship of the decision cannot be known so it is not essential for institutional decisions to 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 follow the rule one who hears must decide but in america and in india it has been the approach of the court that at least it should be known to the parties that who actually decided the case evidence shall not be taken in the back of the party it is also the established principle but if the evidence is taken on the back of the party but that evidence has been supplied to the party concerned and that party has been given the opportunity to contradict or revert that evidence then it would not be violative of principles of natural justice inquiry report shall be shown to the parties it has been the approach of indian courts that when the decision maker relies on the inquiry report it makes the decision on the basis of inquiry report he relies totally on the inquiry report then the person concerned is entitled to see the inquiry reports and the authority must supply the inquiry report to the person concerned but if the authority does not rely on the inquiry report then it is not necessary for the authority to supply the inquiry report these are different components of rule of hearing we discussed all the components of rule of hearing in very detail so the concept and meaning of principles of natural justice the rule against bias and the rule of hearing it is complete code of hearing or it is the complete code of principles of natural justice thank you hello everybody now uh, the discussion which i would try to um, make uh, talk to you is about the excitement which i always feel and i'm sure you will also reciprocate as i proceed and when you do the course 
is in the area of multivariate statistical problems and multivariate statistical analysis. So, what we mean by multivariate? So, we know that statistics is a, is a subject where you ha have a lot of data, you try to analyze that using different type of techniques like estimation problem, MCMC techniques, then forecasting and the area of time series analysis and then try to basically find out the best forecasting tool which you have such that you are able to gain the maximum amount of information from a set of data. Now, in the recent past as we see that multivariate statistics has, has, has really increased in a, in, in a very exciting manner and if I trace back to history it has been going on slowly for the last about 70, 80 years, but now the time has come where it is being used in a very big way and the techniques which we all know, but which are being utilized with new vigor are in the area of say for example, canonical correlation technique, in the area of factor analysis, in the area of conjoint analysis, in the area of clustering analysis, in the area of multidimensional uh, scaling techniques, structural equation modeling, be it in the area of finance, be it in the area of engineering, be it in the area of social sciences, be it in the area of economics, such that you are able to gather the the information from the data in such a way that it really gives you some useful set of information. Now, in the recent um, past, there has been also an explosion of large and complex data sets, but added to that there has also been a, a commensurate increase in the computing and the statistical techniques. So, obviously, the question comes that if the statistical techniques are there for small, so called small data, not the big data, not the, the, the data which is of terabytes and, and, and so on and so forth, where you use different type of computers to stay the data. The question obviously comes that are those statistical techniques really relevant when we use them in the big data sense. The question is they are not always relevant, they may not give you the best results. So, what we are seeing in years to come and, and I feel very excited about that is that how the new tools which we have already learned in statistics in multivariate statistical analysis are being redrawn, are being say for example, remodeled in such a way that they can be utilized along with the techniques of computing in a very nice manner that we are able to garner the information from big data very successfully and very nicely in such a way that they are able to portray a sense of information which we all long to have from big data, be it in say for example, medical sciences, be in the area of finance, be it in weather forecasting, be it in transportation, so on and so forth. So, obviously, it means that students, participants who are in a position with some brief mathematical background to take multivariate statistics and statistical tools as a subject in this program are assured are a very exciting future where they can use these tools to, to both gain the knowledge as well utilize them in a very best practical sense such that they are able to do some justice to the information which is given to them and get the best information from the data sets. I wish all the participants in this course the best of luck and I am sure they will also reciprocate the excitement which I have for this type of courses. Thank you.